Father, bless the word today. Come and teach us. We long for it. Um, we want to eat from your word. So we thank you for it. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hey, one other thing. We might have a slide. Do we have a slide from last night? Yeah, this is uh, last night. Our team, uh, Matthew looks like a bank robber sitting in the, in the uh, Newark, uh, New Jersey airport. And uh, they are um, headed to, well, they're in Dominican Republic this morning as we speak. Now, Hamlin, bless his heart, isn't on the trip. He took a 20-foot fall at the ice caves, and he's going to be okay. Uh, but he's, um, yes, he's, he's, he's needing, needing prayer too. But uh, doctor said, Hamlin, you're not going anywhere. So uh, anyway, pray for those guys, and uh, they start building uh, tomorrow. All right. Well, I'm going to be in Acts chapter uh, 14, and then I'm going to be in Ezekiel chapter 47. And I'm anxious to share the scripture uh, with you this morning. Acts chapter 14. I actually want to um, introduce a series of thoughts, and um, I'll be doing this series probably in July, but I felt led to introduce, introduce it today. Um, next week, you're going to hear Barrett Frizey teach the word. We're excited about that. And uh, yeah, put your hands together for Barrett. And uh, so uh, that's, that's exciting. And then uh, beginning Father's Day, I'm going to teach a series called Refusing Offense. And so um, we'll trust the Lord with that. But I want to talk to you today, and I'm going to be talking a lot this summer. You know, we're not called to build a church. And this isn't my church. This is God's church. And that's the only one he's promised to build. And, uh, but we need to be about building the kingdom of God. And what is the culture of that? And what does that look like? And in verse, tw verse 21 of Acts 14, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then re they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. By the way, let's just stop there because that is a great need for our society today. There are so many voices that are calling people away from God and away from the faith in our nation, in our, in our society. It is our job to strengthen disciples, encourage disciples to remain true to the faith. And then he says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, serving the Lord isn't always a cakewalk. Serving the Lord isn't always easy. Change is difficult for us very often. And all God's people can say amen to that. I saw the expressions on your face. And do you remember, um, let's, just, let's just jump in and then we're going to go to a, a number of other scriptures. Did any of you as kids have um, one of those pools that you blew up? And um, some of them had two rings, some of them had three rings. If you were really uptown, you might have had five rings. It took forever to blow that baby up. But um, some of you had these above ground pools, you know. If you were, if you were entry level, you had a 10 foot above ground pool. But if your family was uptown, man, it was 16 feet, you know. And as a kid, you would get in this pool and it was a round pool and you could create a river. You could create, anybody know what I'm talking about? You could create this current all of the toys would go to the middle, but you were, you know, doing this. You could make yourself as a kid bigger. Tell me I'm not crazy. You, you, know, you, know, you, could, just, you could just do this and, and get in the pool. Some other kid would jump in, and they would get in the current of the pool, and they would get in that movement. The problem was is that pool wasn't self-sustaining. That pool was the only way a movement could happen in that pool of current is a lot of human effort. That's a picture of a lot of churches. We want the biggest pool in town. 
we want to do this and we want to get current, but there's a whole lot of effort for the movement. And it, those kind of pools don't work. But what causes some people to really like them is because they're addicted to the chase lounger that can be beside the pool. In fact, we will never have revival in Buffalo, Wyoming until the church world stops being addicted to being comfortable. Stephanie rocked us a little bit last week, and she taught a very excellent message. And, but at the end, we sang the blessing. Now, we've done that here before. We've sang it over each other. Last week, we sang it over all the churches in Buffalo. And it was like, wow, God. God is moving on that. He's blessing that because he wants to bless the kingdom more than he just wants to bless a people. He wants a kingdom work where all of the family of God comes together and does something for the kingdom of God. Now, the problem with the pool image is there's no intake spirit, there's no outflow ministry. And so that pool without intake spirit, without outflow ministry, becomes stale and stagnant and can't support life. It's always God's intention that life be supported. He came that we might have life. He came so that we could give away life. And so... As I've been thinking about the whole pool analogy, the Spirit of God, I, I know there will always be pools because pools in the Bible were places of healing. But I think that God's longing for a kingdom reality that we're not just pools without an intake and an outflow, but there's an intake and an outflow and the ministry of the kingdom of heaven becomes like a river. A river that gives life to everything it touches. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel's right after Lamentations, right after Jeremiah, right after Isaiah. You probably haven't been there in a little while. Isaiah, excuse me, Ezekiel 47. I love the picture here because I think it's a kingdom picture. Hope you're tracking along at home with your Bibles. Ezekiel 47. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the temple faced the east. You understand why the temple faced the east, right? That's the direction from which the king of kings is coming. So, coming again. And the water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. And he brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. And as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. And then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits. And he led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand but now the river, it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and it was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. By the way, when something is deep enough to swim in, you have to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to trust in the Lord. As long as it's ankle deep, you're safe. You can jump in and you can jump out. As long as it's knee deep, it's still under your control. As long as it's waist deep, you may be able to make a current, but God wants the kingdom of God to be like pools that release, they have inflow, and they have outflow, inflow of the spirit, outflow of the ministry of the kingdom of God, forming a river. Now, what happens? So he asked me, son of man, do you see this? 
and he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. Did you ever stand on a bridge and see a river and see the tree lines? The trees always go up toward the river because the ones that are closest to the nutrients get bigger. And so it's a picture here. He said to me, the water flows toward the eastern region and goes down to Arabah where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. Say that with me. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because the water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. By the way, when the kingdom of God is flowing in power in a town like Buffalo or a town like Mont Rose or a town like Phoenix or a town like Port Ritchie, Florida or even, God love you, a town like Fredonia, Kansas, it will raise the socioeconomics all around. It's called redemption lift. It's true in an individual life. Somebody starts following Jesus, applying the principles of the word, it changes everything. There becomes a switch in their economics. There becomes a switch in their thinking. They move from stinking thinking to kingdom thinking. And they, they move up. Somebody say, let's move up. And the river brings life to everything it touches. Verse 10, fishermen will stand along the shore... From En Gedi to En Englem, I probably pronounced that wrong, it's not England, it's En Egalum, there will be places for the spreading of nets for fish of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. See, I believe that there will become equipping centers that we are called to where we equip people to spread the nets all over the nation spread the nets all over the world to see the kingdom come. Isn't this an amazing passage? But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Now look at this. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. Now, by the way... Um, how often do trees bear fruit in our, in our world? Once a year. Look at this. In the kingdom, every month they will bear fruit. Every month when the river of God is flowing. Every month. And by the way, there will be no confusion. The orange tree won't come along and say, well, I think I'd just like to be an apple tree. I think I was born as an apple tree. I'm just giving... Oh, that's a different message for a different day. Uh, are you, yeah, never mind. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. What a passage of Scripture. Even people on the banks get touched when the church world, the kingdom, the kingdom reality becomes a river. Now, the word kingdom is used 155 times in Scripture. It's the, it's the Greek word basileia, which means dominion. And it means, you know, we pray the prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come say it at home to your will your kingdom come your will be done now whenever we pray that it's in a it's in the aorist tense which means it's a punctiliar action it's an enforcement your kingdom come your will be done in other words lord make it so here just as it is in heaven how many of you know that's one of the greatest prayers that needs to be prayed right now god sweep your kingdom loose in our society, sweep your kingdom loose in a place of confusion, sweep your kingdom loose on us. 
And so the kingdom means that God wants to have dominion over your life. See, one of the reasons people haven't been radically changed and know how to be a new creature in Christ Jesus is they want salvation from hell, but they don't want to a Savior, a Lord who has dominion telling them what to do. And Jesus says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I do? And so there is this need for the kingdom in your life. There's a need for the kingdom in the church. There's a need for the dominion of the Lord in a city, in a country, in a world. And I'm telling you, it is only the people of God that he wants to bring the kingdom into. Now, I want to give you three things about kingdom culture. There's probably about 15 of them that we'll be talking about over the next weeks, but let me give you three things this morning. In fact, let me just give you the three words and then we'll, we'll stop and slow down with each one of them. First of all, the kingdom is seed kingdom, seed harvest. It's a culture of seed. Somebody say seed. seed. It's also a kingdom of sharing. Somebody say sharing so cool you're filling in your blanks as we talk and you'll be done and it's also a kingdom of sending sharing excuse me seed planting sharing and sending let's talk about seed planting it's a seed culture I love uh, so many of the passages of scripture you know it's it's kind of interesting um, I was in Masada some uh, uh, in in 2012, and um, one of the things that happened in Masada is that they were excavating King Herod's palace, and in King Herod's palace they found some seeds for date palms that were stored away in the palace. Um, they estimated those seeds had been there nearly 2,000 years in 2005. They planted one of the Dead Sea palm trees. There's a lot of palm trees that grow in that area. From Masada, you can see the Dead Sea. And in 2005, that seed that was in King Herod's palace germinated and today is a date palm tree. Funny thing about seeds, they do no one any good as long as they're in a palace or a tomb or in your pocket or in your heart. There were uh, coriander seeds. There were watermelon seeds. There were, um, let's see, what other kind of seeds? I have, it, I have it in my notes. In King Tut's tomb, King Tut had all of these, uh, yeah, millet, barley, black cumin, coriander, and watermelon, all in King Tut's tomb. Guess what? Those seeds did no good. Seeds don't do any good until they're planted and they die and there's a resurrection. The seed that you're carrying, what are you carrying it for? What are you saving it for? Now, you never eat all your seed. That's a dumb thing to do, right? You never consume all your seed. But in the kingdom of God, God has planted the seed of Abraham in you. God has planted the seed of Jesus in you. Your life is to bear fruit because he's planted in you seed. You carry seed through which when it's put into the ground and it dies, it germinates, comes resurrection, and it births up and bears fruit. It may be a seed of a word of encouragement that you need to plant in somebody. It may be the seed of of some income that you have that you're sowing into the kingdom of God. It may be the seed of faith that you're saying, well, I'm going to trust God with this. But look at John 12, um, 24. Most assuredly, how about you read it with me? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Haggai verse 2, chapter 2, verse 19 says, Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Because until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not 
borne fruit. In other words, the sign that there's not fruit in the kingdom is a sign that kingdom people aren't planting the seeds because when the seeds are planted, the fruit will be a byproduct of having planted the seeds. Mark 4, 26, Jesus told them this parable. God's kingdom realm is like someone spreading seed on the ground. He goes to bed and gets up day after day, and the seed sprouts and grows tall. And though he knows not how, all by itself it sprouts. And the soil produces a crop, first the green stem, then the head of the stalk, and then the fully developed grain in the head. Then when the grain is ripe, he immediately puts the sickle into the grain because harvest time has come. By the way, a kingdom people who don't have growth, either in their individual lives or in their church, something is wrong with that because it's the nature of seed to germinate, to grow, and to produce disciples, to produce crops. In fact, the sign of maturity in anyone is reproduction. That's true of us physically. That's also true of us spiritually. Now, a lot of people come along and say, well, I don't have, I don't have much seed. And the seed I got, it's really little. Well, Jesus talked about little seed, didn't he, huh? We know that he talked to us numerous times about the mustard seed. And how the mustard seed is the smallest, but it becomes a large plant through which birds can uh, perch in its branches. And I love this passage. Jesus responded, it's uh, Luke 17, verse 6. If you have even the smallest measure of authentic faith, this is in the Passion, it would be powerful enough to say to this mulberry tree, My faith will pull you up by the roots and throw you into the sea, and it will respond to your faith, and it will obey you. Now, some people say, well, I spoke to the mountain, or I spoke to the tree. Now, that's not going to work for me. I can go out to the tree, and that's not going to happen because the tree isn't my thing right now. And... I'm just not needing to experiment with the kingdom of God. I need to believe him for my mountain. I need to believe him for what's rooted in my life. And he says, take that mustard seed and believe God and trust God. One of the things, well, I love 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I don't want to mention it. When there's seed planting, there is, I don't want to fail to mention it, I didn't mean to say. When there's seed planting, it's usually a team. Paul says, I watered, uh, or I planted, Apollos watered, but what? But God gave the increase. It's always God that, you know, takes our little bit and makes more with it, takes our little bit together, and he multiplies it, and he blesses it, and he uses it. And it's always God that gives the increase. One thing about kingdom people is they have an insatiable appetite for the impossible. Don't you believe the lie that says impossible things don't happen anymore? I hear people say all the time, well, I don't believe in miracles. Well, you got up this morning, didn't you? You could see this morning, right? You could hear this morning, every day is a miracle, right? Every day is a gift of God. And I don't know why John the Baptist was in prison. You know, I don't know why sometimes I haven't had answered prayers, but I know that I am going to go after what seems impossible and trust God with it. I'm still believing Dennis's grandson's going to be healed in Jesus' name, and the time will come we're going to see that. I believe that with all of my heart. God loves little Van. He's precious in the sight of the Lord. And just because something hasn't happened doesn't believe mean it can't happen in Jesus' name. And just because things look impossible, I tell you, I'm planting seeds that say, I'm, I'm just going to keep asking, and I'm going to trust the Lord for his goodness and his mercy. 
because whatever he did here in this word, he can still do in Jesus' name. Thank you. He can do it in Jesus' name. Well, that's the seed. Let's talk about sharing. This one, um, I don't really care for. Um, you know, and I'm like, Lord, um, do we need to talk about this? Because, you know, I'm good. But look at this passage in Acts chapter 4. All of the believers were in one heart and mind. Uh, isn't that interesting? All of the believers were in one heart and mind. By the way, when the, when the Spirit came at Pentecost, there were Jesus had appeared to over 500 at one point, but 120 were in the upper room. Do you know why the 120 were in the upper room? Is because that's who was in one accord. That's who was in one heart and one mind. And all of the believers then in the book of Acts are in one heart and one mind. And by the way, that's kingdom there. Doesn't mean we all think alike, but it means we all get on the same page with God's help. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. You know, I'm willing to share my mashed potatoes with you. <laughs> but sharing other things Let's read the scripture. I'm not going to preach on this. I'm just going to read it and be done. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work. Wow. In them that there were no needy persons among them. Now, in America, let's just let the government take care of everything. That's how we do it here. But it's not biblical. And the reason we got problems in our society today is the church hasn't been the church. When the church is the church, like it was in the church in this book, man, look out, things will change. Things will shake. Things will move. The power of God, the grace will be upon them from time to time. Those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who was in need. I get it. That's a kairos moment. There was that moment in time where God seemed to be working in that way. At the same time, there's a principle that says, in the kingdom of God, I can't be selfish. I need to be willing to share what I have with you. I love the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember the robber came along and there were, there were those that came along and they all had different values. The robber came along and said, what is yours is mine and I'm going to take it. And the Levite and the priest came along and said, what is mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. And then the Samaritan came along and he said, what is mine is God's and I'm going to give it. And so a kingdom culture is always caring culture. And it's easy for me just to pray for you and put a band-aid on your stuff instead of me being a part of the solution. Well, God gave you this problem to show you his goodness. Can, I, can, we, can we just talk about the goodness of God for a minute? God doesn't give anybody cancer. Because God can't give what God doesn't have. And kingdom culture is based on the fact that God is good all the time and the devil is bad all the time. I said the devil's bad all the time. He breaks through to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. God doesn't give addiction so that you can get closer to Jesus. God can't give what God doesn't have. God doesn't give things like epilepsy. 
and we look at things like, and I'm just naming a couple of things, and we look at things and we see some occasional healings. I'd long to see what I saw in Laos all the time, but we think God can't deal with things like dyslexia. God can't deal, with, those are off limits to God. Could I tell you, so many things that we take for granted are the result of the curse and a river gives life to everything that it touches. And we need an insatiable appetite for what we call impossible now. Jesus so often is waiting on us to step up and enter into sometimes prayer and fasting and difficult prayer, difficult times, difficulty in the kingdom, to fight the good fight, to fight the battle, and say, if God is for us, who can be against us? God wants far more for us than we have any idea. We plant seeds, we share, we believe, we trust him. Number three, it's a sending culture. It's a sending culture. It's, a, it's really a, an interesting thing. Uh, let's read the first scripture. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, this is Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now, I think it's so cool about ascending culture. Um, I love seeing Barrett here. And, um, you know, when Barrett graduated from high school, Barrett, there were probably people that were really glad to send you off, baby. <laughs> I mean, but here you are, and now you're back here, and the day's going to come that you're going to kneel here and that we're going to anoint you and we're going to send you off into some ministry. By the way, the church in Fredonia, Kansas, that church has never been bigger than 120. And don't you guys forget this in Fredonia, but your church has sent over 60 people into full-time missions in its 100 years. And I know you're not 120 now. I know you're struggling to keep the doors open, but don't you forget what God has done. Because a healthy church sends people. I told Rob last night, Matthew will come back from Dominican Republic forever changed. Because Matthew has calling on his life. And who knows? Margaret, you got sent out one time from here. And others have been sent out. But we're going to see people sent out. And because the church becomes like a river... Let's not just be this 10-foot pool where we say, let's just keep everybody together and keep everybody happy. How many of you know in a 10-foot space you never keep anybody happy? <laughs> Chapter 14, they preached the gospel to that city and won large number of disciples, and then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. And Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed to them to the Lord in whom they put their trust. Now, there are times, some of you have come here from other churches and there are those that have left here and gone to other churches. And that's always a little hard, except that God aligns the parts of the body as he chooses. And sometimes he's moving the body of Christ around. Do you know where you should go to church? Where you can flourish? I said where you can flourish. And it's painful, but sometimes... It's the book of Acts, and somebody moves, leaves, and it leaves a hole, which in a way, that's good, because the river's flowing somewhere else, and somebody has to step up and take on the anointing. Remember when Elijah left, Elisha, you think Elijah didn't leave a hole in society? 
but the mantle fell on all those prophets that were there, the school of prophets now led by Elisha. Verse 5, chapter 15, so the men were sent off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. And after spending time with them there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. So uh, a week ago Monday, um, two weeks ago yesterday, I had a conversation that uh, kind of punched me in the gut. And um, I know some of you online won't know this, so this is kind of a, congreg- uh, a conversation for our congregation uh, but I was having a, a visit with um, Randy and Susie Longnecker. Most of you here know them. And uh, Randy and Susie told Marlis and myself that they're moving. And that uh, at the end of June, they're moving to McCook, Nebraska. And I said, what did you do that would deserve that kind of punishment? Oh, sorry. I was born in Nebraska. No, I didn't say that at all. But Randy's mom lives in McCook, and so they're moving to take care of his mom, who has some failing health. And do you know how sometimes you have a prayer time, and your prayer time resembles a complaint to God? more than a prayer and so on Tuesday morning I was praying and about them leaving and uh, because they're going to leave whole Um, Randy leads people to Jesus all the time and, and may his boldness fall on many of you and may his prophetic gift fall on some and not everybody understands Randy because we can't hear the music he's dancing to. So, if I've ever heard the Lord speak to me, I heard it Tuesday morning, and here's what I heard. I heard, Randy and Susie are moving to McCook, Nebraska in answer to the prayer of somebody in McCook who is praying for revival. Let me say it again, because I heard it so clearly. Randy and Susie are moving to McCook, Nebraska, because somebody in McCook is having their prayer answered for revival in McCook. Now, we will always be their home church, I believe. And one of the next equipped conferences will probably be in a year or two in in McCook, Nebraska. But see, guys, we're going to go through those times where we send people out. We're going through those times where people are drawn here from all over to get an anointing, to learn how to cast nets, to be equipped, because our DNA is equipping. Our DNA is seeking the Lord to use us. And no, not everybody will understand the music that Grace Fellowship is dancing to. Not There will be somebody that thinks some of you are insane. But it's because they're not hearing the music that the Spirit of God is breathing on you. So, dance away, baby. Seed, sharing, sending. We got a pool. It's awesome. People are going to come from all over to be trained and equipped. But let's never lose sight. We're a river. Not going to be ankle deep. Not going to be knee deep. Not going to be waist deep. 
we're going to have where God's calling you. You're going to have to trust the Spirit to do it in you because your feet won't be touching the bottom. Your feet won't be relying on your flesh. Marlis heard a prophetic word one Saturday night that some of us, some of us need to be filled from the bottom up because we're so trusting in our mind and our flesh and we need to be trusting in the things of the Spirit. Father, thank you. Worship team, come on. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Randy and Susie. Bless them as they leave us. And just bless the body here. And would you just minister grace to us? And would you work in our lives? We love you. We thank you. Make us a river. Make us a river. Well, let me read John 7 before these guys sing. Because it's our prayer. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, everybody stand. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as the scripture has said, say it with me. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. Read it again. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. Somebody read it this way. Rivers of living water will flow from within me. Say it. Rivers of living water will flow from within me. One more time. Rivers of living water will flow from within me. <laughs>